It's a not very technical talk, more of an overview or a, I guess throwing you into the deep end, but it's not going to be anything that's going to go over your head, or I hope not. And if it does, please let me know so I can explain it in a, in a better way. So let's get started. Really quick, um, I have three months left at Champlain College. I uh, attend the online program and uh, finishing cybersecurity and networking. Um, I have an associate's degree from Herkimer County Community College. Um, I'm Security Plus certified. My official title, according to my boss, would be a cybersecurity samurai, but really my role is a security consultant and a penetration tester. So this talk has a lot in it, but it's going to consist of the ethics, the gamifying or gamification, um, the academia standpoint, and then some definitions or explanations so that maybe you guys can understand the concepts of offensive security a little bit more. Um, ethics is a really important thing, especially to me in this field, because when you get hired as a pen tester, uh, they give you access to things that you know they don't normally do, even to their own employees. Um, it's a it's a lot of responsibility and a lot of risk they put. So it's really important that you keep the the ethical and the moral obligation and and responsibility that they're giving you um, in mind. And that's what really, it's the first on this talk because it really, uh, it scared me thinking about giving this access to people that I went to school with already or that I go to school with. I mean, you know, people in their 20s don't always do the smartest things. So I would start ethics being a huge part of it starting, you know, the first day, freshman year, sophomore year, you should have some form of ethics, uh, especially directly correlating to cybersecurity or offensive security. I mean, it's just, it's something that really would have to be hammered in and you would really need professors who know what they're doing and really care about the ethics as well and understand, you know, what, what you're training these people to do. Um, so uh, the next part would, uh, would be you need to have some established honor code. Um, it's an honor system like a lot of things and it's really similar to the honor system that we have with clients because they don't have the time or the resources to monitor us all the time. And so there are times where, you know, where we will uh, probe a client or, or do some test and, and they have no idea that we did this. And that's not, again, that's not something I would want to leave uh, up to any 20 year old or anyone who has an interest in it. It's something that needs to be, you know, hammered in that these, this is right and this is wrong. And it would have to be off some honor code, which, if you do break it, you would be, you know, uh, kicked out. No exceptions. And I think it has to be like that, and I'll get to, to why. Um, it would have to be over the course of a, a Capture the Flag framework, which is a, a type of game that has grown in popularity. Um, and I'll get, I'll explain that, what, what that is in a few slides. Uh, the learning management system, which, you know, Blackboard, Canvas, a lot of us have experience using that if you've gone to undergraduate school. And then a wiki, and all of these things should span multiple majors. A lot of this stuff, it doesn't necessarily have to be for offensive security. There are things that computer scientists, that you know, uh, defensive security uh, professionals can benefit from, and they should. And you should want to educate these offensive security students in a way where they're learning off the defensive security students. So kind of pitting them together. Uh, again, zero tolerance. And the most important part, I think, to deter uh, people from doing stuff they're not supposed to would be a immensely large virtual lab simulation. Um, I would think of, you know, having a, uh, a CTF framework that's not the one where they do all their homework, but one that they can test. Um, a learning management system, um, a fake company, a fake website, all of this stuff that needs to be there so that if they feel the need, they can, they have some way to get rid of that, that need or that desire to, to try something. Um, because the more you go into it, the more you look around and think, well, what is that? How does that work? Or maybe if I try that and you can't do that, um, in education. Why I think we should gamify it as much as possible. 
Um, well, one, it's a popular approach. Uh, competition is really useful and it pushes uh, other people. And I think competition in this case especially um, is not something where it's like, you know, good versus evil or one person wins and one doesn't. I think gamifying offensive security like in CTFs, it pushes people to learn more and off of each other. And it, it is like the, the most useful competition um, around. Uh, something important to note would be that honor system that needs to be established would not have anything to do with the point system in this this game. So, you know, you you finish your homework, you submit, and you get 10 points towards your 100 uh, for your homework. Um, it needs to be completely separate from the honor system because the honor system needs to be, again, you know, if you step out of line, that's it. There's no second chances. Uh, whereas in the CTF, if you try to submit something, so if you try to submit an answer that's wrong, I, I think that they should absolutely be able to try that again. It shouldn't be, you know, memorize this and spit it back like, like uh, a lot of tests are today. I think this uh, gamifying it would also keep people engaged. Um, I mean, you see apps on the, on the App Store that are, you know, life games, you know, the how, how much have you ran today, how much have you eaten, and it gives you points and it grades you. And, and it's the same idea. It can keep people engaged in the same way. Um, one thing that does correlate is that point system, and that would correlate to the grade system. So how I would envision it would be instead of going to these learning management systems where it's, you know, write your paper in this, uh, with this template and submit it, um, the points in these games, so the more they find, the more they hack, the more they submit, the higher their grade. Uh, and I think that pushes teamwork together as well. And then the last thing would be leaderboards, uh, and that's the last piece from gaming I think that we should take. And that is just, it gives people a better view of where they stand compared to their peers, where they need to work on, where they don't need to work on, where they could help others. And it also, you know, it may push you to try harder, to, to do more. Um, within academia, I can see an offensive security degree being, you know, perfectly legitimate and plenty of material to do that. And I think that should be a thing. You know, there is cybersecurity and I, I love the degrees I have and I'm happy that it's, uh, that I have the, the possibility to do that, but there needs to be an offensive security degree. I mean, the, no matter what, you can't cover everything in a two year or a four year or six years, you know, and offensive security is one of those things. It needs, it needs its own major. We need to produce people who, who know what they're doing, who have a passion for it, and who have been studying it for years before they enter the job market. I also see it as a minor um, for IT, for information security, uh, for cybersecurity, or even for computer science, because there are all, these are all fields that you could take aspects, take topics, you know, take things that you learn and apply it in offensive security. So just in case you don't know, I'm going to explain a little bit about what a capture the flag is. Um, capture the flag is, uh, it's like a, like a war game kind of. Um, you have missions and you have, that you're given and you know you're supposed to take certain steps or find certain things, uh, like maybe an I spy you can think of, and you submit them and you get points. You go through stories and learn things. You go through networks, go through systems, and uh, explore stuff. And I think because it has such a huge following now, I mean, there's there's ones online, ones at schools, everywhere. Um, it needs to be picked up more. It needs to be used across schools, across states, across the country, across the world, not just through these nonprofit organizations or these these private entities, but through the education system, because they're just missing out. Um, one really good resource for that is uh, VulnHub, um, and that's a, a website that contains a lot of boot to root, and uh, that means you download this, this image of an operating system, you install it, and you, you load it up, and you get right to work, and it's meant to be broken into. And I think people look past the value in that a lot. 
um, and especially in schools because you know you don't you don't have to to set up your giant virtual lab that, that I suggest you know you don't need to do it from scratch you don't need to buy all these operating systems you there are resources out there already for the professionals use and that you know I use for fun and for practice that that would work great in a CTF that would work great in this context and the most uh, another important thing would be you know freshman year a lot of students walk in they may not have the the technical skills or the uh, expertise to to do a professional CTF but they do have enough that they can do trivia questions and I think that alone even though it's the same as a multiple choice question that formatting you know a monopoly or not a monopoly I'm sorry a jeopardy like formatting um, that would engage people more that would keep people interested more you know so it's not doesn't have to be super technical people hear CTF and they think of the most technical thing they can and it's not always the case and I think that you should get access to this at day one all of this needs to start the second you walk in so that they understand what they're signing up for how serious this is and what this could lead to for them in their life um, very similar to CTF but not exactly the same would be these red versus blue uh, I could explain it really as a cyber war game I would say that's where it started um, red team versus blue team so offensive versus defensive um, it's in, seen in first-person shooters very often as well uh, how I think about it is is games where you have to um, there's a team that goes and tries to plant a bomb and there's a team that tries to defend the bomb or defuse the bomb and I see it very similar to that. You have the IT students, you have the IS students, you have the computer science students protecting these assets, and you have the offensive security students trying to, to break these assets, take control of these assets. And then also in politics, I think, um, besides just the colors, I think it's very clear, especially recently, you know, how it is red versus blue in uh, politics. And the, the biggest point of this is there's a two-field approach and it's not how it is right now right now it's cybersecurity which is in, which encompasses many many fields including ones in, uh, seen in intrusion uh, response computer science information technology information security and I think if we look at it from an education standpoint as offensive and defensive we can reach out to more students it would make sense to more students and there's more there for students to learn so really quick, I'm just going to go over the fields of study within offensive security and defensive security. Um, so in offensive security, uh, that consists of operation security, network security, system security, physical security, web security, reverse engineering, uh, social engineering, open source intelligence, methodologies and mindset, and then basically anything within IT, IS, or CS. Um, for those who don't know, uh, I picked a few of those fields just to explain, so maybe uh, if you don't know, you will when you walk out of here. So um, social engineering is something that a lot of people associate with phishing and other digital attacks. Um, phishing being uh, the, those scam emails that you get that try to trick you into putting your you know, username or password in or your credit card number. Um, Spear phishing, where it's specific to one person, so instead of sending it to a thousand random emails, they pick you and they send it to you. Um, whaling would be when you choose an executive and you choose them and only send that, that uh, attempt, that fraud attempt or scam to them. War dialing, where you enumerate or call a list of numbers that, own, or that are owned by a company in hopes that you identify a fax or some other sensitive information, maybe a an executive's internal phone number um, and then as I was saying the physical side of social engineering is like conning so it's the con men you know you see in Ocean's 11 and Ocean's 12 and that's important because in most contexts you'll see social engineering they're talking about fishing or whaling or or something like that but there's a lot more to it there's the whole physical side to it open source intelligence which is probably the one I think the most people have the, uh, the least amount of experience with because it's fairly new. Um, it's called OSINT sometimes. Maybe you'll read it as uh, human intelligence. Um, it's generally passive, so it's 
gathering intelligence or information about a company or a target without going to their website, without going to their physical building and dumpster diving, without you know calling these people and tricking them into telling you something. This is all stuff you use the crazy amount of websites on the internet for. Um, and I use this on engagements all the time. Um, so you, you use services like a search engine that indexes Twitter and you look through tweets that people have sent out before, hopefully finding emails or pictures of people or uh, you know other sensitive information like that. Um, some of the stuff you could find or that I have found in the past, documents, people's names, emails, phone numbers, IP addresses, license plates, uh, reverse image search is a great example of open source intelligence. Um, I also have found VIN numbers. I found garage codes. I found, I mean, a, a disgusting amount of information about people. Methodologies and mindsets. Um, methodologies, I guess I would define as general instructions. Uh, sometimes they come in the form of topics or points to cover. Sometimes they're just tools and instructions. Um, but really, they're, they're basically guidelines. And the mindset is to think like an attacker. And that is something that you hear a lot, but may not make sense to you. Um, how I like to think about it is, uh, for years, I carried a USB drive on my keys. And I named it Risky. And I put some malware on it. And I would walk around into businesses. I'd walk in the interviews or my first day at a, uh, as a sales associate at the mall. And I thought about how my manager locked me in her, her office to fill out my paperwork to watch my training videos on cybersecurity and how bad it is to do that with a USB pocket or USB drive in my pocket that I could have easily plugged into her computer, which was perfectly unlocked and, you know, wreaked havoc. And I think that's something that a lot of people overlook. Um, since I've started this job and a little bit before, you know, this is something that is 24-7, I think, like an attacker. You know, I walk around and I, uh, I guess you could call me paranoid, but I, I think about, you know, the lack of security. I think about, you know, why are they, let, why, how is this, how do they let me in the manager's office, lock me in, close the door, put the, sh the shade down, and leave me there until, you know, I, I tell them that I'm done. Uh, it's, it's mind-blowing, and I think this is one of the biggest things to do, but once you do it, it's for life. You will never look at things the same. It changes your perspective, um, and I think that's a good thing. By physical security, you know, the three Gs, gates, guards, and guns. Um, another example, cameras, man traps. Um, the big thing about physical security is they only do as much as the, the gates, guards, and guns do. So if you put someone who is not happy with their job as a security guard, they may not be a very good security guard. You know, if you put someone who is told, well, if something happens, you know, you need to come hard, you need to hurry and, and stop that, well, now you're telling them to be reactive, not proactive. And it's tough to get past that, that hump, and I, I couldn't tell you what in physical security could be proactive or more proactive, but I think it's just something to keep in mind that, you know, just because there is someone with a you know, a good person with a gun and a badge and a fence does not mean that they're making sure that no one gets past that fence or their gun or their badge. Um, it, it's, it sucks, but that's just the way it is. And operation security, which I could have put a definition, but I figured this would make a little bit more sense to people um, because operation security covers stuff that may have been covered within network security or physical security. So I'll tell you a story. Um, that I read on Reddit uh, a few years ago. And uh, so basically, around September 15th, 2016, an ISIS member was killed by a U.S. airstrike. You know, not something that's very uncommon nowadays, unfortunately, but it does happen. Uh, the interesting part is, this was eight days after he hosted a Reddit Ask Me Anything, which is when you go to this site, Reddit, you sign up, and for a few hours, you respond to everyone's comments. So anyone could go on there and say, hey, how does this work? Or, hey, what do you do? And he was doing it. He was answering all these people's questions. Um, the mistake he made uh, was when he was asked for a selfie and his coordinates, he said, I'm not giving you my coordinates. That's silly. But he did put a selfie on there. And it turns out that he did not have geotagging off. And so his coordinates, his exact location was in it. And sure enough, 
eight days later, supposedly, he was uh, bombed and killed. Um, so that's what happens when you don't follow Operation Security. It's a very uh, extreme example, but I thought it would get the point across. Uh, another interesting one that I was I found while I was looking some stuff up for this talk was war chalking. And um, war chalking itself is not Operation Security. Um, but that is the act of drawing symbols in public places to uh, advertise an open Wi-Fi network. And I just thought that was a very interesting attack on Operation Security. Um, you know, a vulnerability, I guess you can say, uh, in Operation Security that I never would have thought of. Because, I, I, you know, why would I think that someone who was walking by and looking at the Wi-Fi networks would, would mark us on my wall so that everyone else knows? But that is a very, again, extreme example of how someone can break your operation security and how important it is. So within defense and security, it's a lot of the same stuff. Uh, I would say the, the biggest differences are the hardened programming. Um, so when you are making a tool, not to say the NSA or the CIA's tools aren't good, but they do not think about security in their tools, their offensive security tools, you know, uh, and that's something that defensive people really need to do more and more and more from the beginning. It's not after the fact. Don't, don't, you know, patch stuff after the fact, but make it secure from the beginning. Um, digital forensics, and then incident and disaster recovery. And that's not to say that any of those things aren't helpful or useful when it comes to op uh, offensive security, but it's more stuff that you would want experts in for defensive, not for offensive. So red versus blue, I would want this to be a competition, and I think this needs to, to, be, to be picked up, so whoever's willing to do that. Um, it needs to put defensive security students against offensive security students in simulations that will resemble real-life uh, experiences and real-life job opportunities. Um, so how I would see it, you know, you have an asset and you have people trying to break in, people trying to stop it. It's kind of like um, the Northeastern College Gate Defense Cup of Cyber Competition, but instead of having cyber security or offensive security professionals being the red team in this case, I think they should put other students in as the red team. And I think that would benefit more people and bring more students to the schools. And I could really see this being growing into something like eSports is today. Um, you know, a team, a team for both blue and red teams, you know, cyber sports if, if ESPN wants to reach out. Um, but I think that's something that's going to happen whether, you know, schools jump on board first or not or whether they're the ones to do it first or not. Um, another big aspect that I don't see at colleges, uh, a bug bounty program. Um, and a bug bounty program is basically when uh, a company or an entity or organization has uh, steps you can take that give anyone or select people access to test things. So it's instead, you know, we get contracted, but this is stuff open to the public or open to registration. You register, they say, okay, you can try to break into you know, our website. And if you find something, we'll pay you for it. And that is supposed to deter people from going to the black market or selling it to criminals or to, you know, to the high level government. Um, and I think schools, I mean, I have no idea why schools aren't doing it now. Um, almost every company does. And I think schools need to do that. Um, in my case, how I feel is juniors, excuse me, Juniors within the offensive security major or minor, they should get access to this their junior year. Um, it should be unique to each school because unlike the CTF, these vulnerabilities or these uh, bugs will be unique to the school. Um, most likely, they're not going to be, you know, stuff that you can just set up in a virtual lab because this is stuff that has to be live. Is the difference? Um, I think it could reward scholarships, you know, school store credit or school branded items. It's something they could put on their CV and, and advertise when they, they go to transfer. Uh, it, it's just, it's very beneficial to both the school to find these bugs so that bad people don't. And for students who can then go to schools and say, look, I've, you know, I've done this and I've done this. And, and they could leave with a more verbose, verbose and more confident CV. Um, I also would suggest a plaque for the student because I would imagine at least after the first few years he wouldn't 
you wouldn't find many, or a lot of students wouldn't, because you know they're not starting uh, with access to this or with the knowledge that they, you know, maybe you could do a lot with it. But by the time you know maybe three or four uh, kids graduate, you probably would find a lot of bugs. I mean, there's a lot of people, and a lot of people spend a lot of time and have their own unique ways. And I just I think this would push people to become more technical in their outside time for more reason than you know, I want to know how to do this, because that may not motivate everyone. But if they know that they get a scholarship, maybe that would. Um, I think this would be a minor test for students as well, for their ethics, and if they understand what's right and wrong, and, and you know, if they're, they understand the responsibility that they're being given. Um, it's good practice taking technical notes and writing technical reports, which is something I have to do every day. Um, and it's really important and good to, to you know, learn how to do it and how to start practicing it as soon as possible. And I think a bug bounty program would, would help that with that. And then it would also help with practical use of following these instructions or these steps that you would take in the real world, but not in the real world or not in an environment where you're being contracted, you're being paid, you, this you know company is letting you see your sensitive information. If it's something for your school, um, it's something I think a lot more people would be willing to to participate in. A little more specific, so we had the fields of offensive security, and now we'll have some topics. Um, and this is the biggest reason why uh, current cybersecurity degrees don't cover enough um, of offensive security because there is so much. Um, that's why we need our own degree program, our own major. Um, so within offensive security, there are vulnerability assessments, internal penetration tests, external penetration tests, web app penetration tests, phishing, social engineering, physical penetration tests, reconnaissance, operation security, offensive security tools and tool creation, and then cyber intelligence or counter cyber intelligence. Um, these are all things that I, I do for my job, and I think more people would want to do if they had, you know, access to the the steps they can take to do that or the opportunity to do, to do that. And obviously, you know, I'm no expert in every one of them. I will never be an expert in every one of them, and that's why I think it's so important that we get people started on them as early as possible. Uh, tips and tricks. So this is just a random, I guess, blop, blop of, uh, of facts, tips, and tricks that I've acquired or learned over the years um, because I have been doing this stuff way before I was in school. Uh, the biggest thing, you know, push through if you get lost on something or in something. You know, I can't tell you how many times I've spent four hours trying to just turn something on that wouldn't work, wouldn't boot up, just to find out that, you know, I, I put it down for the night, I come back, and I just, you know, was hitting the wrong key or something, just the wrong key one time. But I spent four hours on it. And you have to learn how to stop yourself, how to recognize those types of things so that you don't waste six hours of the client's time you know, looking into a vulnerability that you knew from the beginning wasn't vulnerable anyway, um, or wasn't applicable in that case anyway. And that's, it's tough, but it's something that you need to keep in mind when you're experimenting with this stuff. We all get lost into it. We all get overwhelmed. We all, it's, you know, something goes over our heads every time, and you just have to persevere through it. Um, if you haven't, if you can't tell with my ethics, you know, involving the legal system is not worth it. It's never worth it, especially in this context. You know, I'm not going to tell you that they're going to find you if you try to do an SQL injection on some website um, in China, but that doesn't mean you don't know what you're doing. You don't know what could happen, uh, and you don't know what a company would view you like. You know, are they going to hire you just because you weren't caught? Um, if you're notorious or infamous or, you know, you go into your interview and say, well, I did this, but I wasn't supposed to, and the cops never came, so, you know, I don't have a record. Well, it's like, yeah, but but if you're willing to do that, if that's, you know, if you don't understand the, the moral line, um, you're a risk. You're a bigger risk, you know, than, than an attacker in some cases even. 
Um, something I think that a lot of people have trouble understanding is there's no hack that will make you the best. Um, coming from someone who has explored the dark net or Tor or whatever you want to call it, who has explored hacker forms that have come and go, you know, every other day, uh, they are very tunnel, very small view, and they are very tunnel vision. Um, they don't see the big picture. They don't see the steps that you would have to take in a real penetration test. They are specific to, you know, if you're running Windows and it's Tuesday and it's raining, you could exploit it. And that's it. And it's it's great and you could spend the time to learn that, but it's not gonna help you, you know, in the long run. It's it's too specific. And almost everything you read, all of this media stuff, it's very specific. If you have this version number, you know, and the media will say, if you have this version, if you're running Windows, you're screwed and you're gonna get hacked and that's not the case, no matter what. Um, nine out of ten times when I find something that comes up vulnerable in a tool that has a vulnerable version, that has the library that's, that's old and needs to be updated, I can't do anything with it anyway. Maybe it's not implemented. You know, there's a, a thousand reasons why, but it is what it is. There's nothing that you can just download or that you can just learn and that's it. Now you could apply this in any context in any case. Every system, every infrastructure, every organization is different. Um, another big thing that this was hard for especially me uh, is you will never know everything. Um, I go through phases where I'm very confident in my abilities and my knowledge base. And I go through phases where I am not very confident in my ability and my knowledge base. Um, one of those times was when I started working at, at Elite Cybersecurity. And I mean, I walked in, you know, was confident I could do anything you guys do, I could do it better. And I got, you know, thrown on my ass really quick. And I, I appreciate that and I see that. And I don't think everyone has to go through that. If you just understand that it is constantly growing, it is constantly changing, there is more and more being discovered, you won't be cocky, you won't be over the top, you won't become infamous, you know. If you don't do it for the lulls and you do it because you care, you won't, you won't end up with that attitude. Um, another thing I found very helpful um, is how you view things you've learned. So for a year I was a computer science major. Um, I did not like it at all. Definitely not for me. Uh, and it didn't, it didn't until about two years later did I really look at it and say, wow, I actually benefited a lot more from that than I, than I thought. You know, I can look at this, this C++ code that I found on a, on a client's site and I can understand it. And that alone is something, you know. Um, just the context that you learn things in, especially in school, is not the context that you have to use them in. Uh, and that's important, especially in offensive security. It helps when I read things about cybersecurity or policy or, you know, I could look at policy the same way I look at a, a CVE or an exploit or an RCE, you know, um, even though they're very different. So everything from body language to guards, gates, and guns is applicable to offensive security, and that I think is something a lot of people overlook as well. Uh, they don't realize that. Um, something that it took me to get hired to know was uh, it's not a nine to five job. It never ends. Um, I work till four in the morning a lot of the nights uh, just because I can and I I just get in the mode and I, I get addicted to it basically and I just can't stop. I mean, it's just it's so interesting to me. Um, but it is extremely frustrating and discouraging when you spend you know, every waking moment 20 hours a day for a week and find nothing. Uh, and I found that if you step back at those times and give yourself time to recover and go back, you know, I mean, I remember this one night I spent 60 hours and that Monday I didn't go in after that. That was a week I spent 60 hours on this one, one website. And I went in Tuesday morning, I sat down, I turned it on, I looked at one of the, the URLs that I saved and it was the login portal. And I had no idea that that was there. I had no memory of it. I was just in such, you know, tunnel vision on I need to find an RCE. I need to find, you know, X or Y. I need to find a, a CGI script that it just, it ended up not being helpful. Um, 
and then also look at the big picture, not through the eyes of a single exploit. So I kind of mentioned that, but you know, again, uh, you know, WannaCry is a, gr a great example. Um, there is no end all or be all in, in this, and there is no exploit that's going to work everywhere. There is no, you know, no pen test have I been on that's been okay. I, I use one exploit and I have root access to the domain administrator. No, that's just, it's not the case. You have to pivot, you have to go through. And until you get to poke around real infrastructure or really good virtual infrastructure, you know, you're not gonna know what it's like. And I, you know, like I said, I went in my first day and I was very confident and I was learning things left and right because I, I never even thought about looking at, you know, LDAP ports or SNMP because I don't have those at my house. You know, I don't, I don't have those you know, um, on my my DC that I have in my virtual machine because, you know, I didn't, what was the point of that? But there is a point of it, it is used. There are things that you will miss until you go on a real engagement, until you do a realistic uh, CTF. And I think that we need to, to do more of those for students especially. Um, I think you need to spend hours upon hours uh, that's never ending because there's constantly more um, and I find it easy to do that. You may not, but if offensive security is what you want to do, prepare for it because you will have to. You know, nothing you do will, I would say nothing, but eight out of ten times that tool that worked on the last engagement will not work on this one. Um, so just be prepared. And strive to understand what you were doing and not just how to do it. Uh, I think this is something that I've met people in the industry and they look past as well. Um, you know, if it, if it works, why, why mess with it? Uh, in my, my eyes, um, the reason to mess with it is so that you understand why it works. Because just because it works, you know, just because it looks like it on the outside doesn't mean it's actually happening on the inside. Um, another thing, research, uh, which is a loose word that can mean anything from Googling to reading white papers to reading uh, jars, uh, joint analysis responses, you know, from the DHS or the FBI or stuff like that. All of those are very interesting and take them with a grain of salt, but, you know, you can learn a lot just from reading a paper and I, people look past that. You know, if it's not a talk, I don't want to know about it. I don't want to have to sit there and read it, but you, you have to. You have to spend the time. You have to research always, every day, see what's going on. Uh, you should keep one eye on current events within the field. Um, another thing, um, you know, like again, WannaCry, uh, we had to contact some clients when we read about that because we were afraid they were going to be targeted. And it's the same idea, you know, you're going to, stuff that is useful today will be obsolete tomorrow. And I know you've probably heard that a lot, but it's it's never been truer till today. You know, it's and it's going to be worse and worse and worse. So you have to pay attention to what's going on. And that means more than what's on Fox or what's on CNN. That means, you know, going on hacker forums, going on Tor, going on Freenet, going on IRCs, you know, all these sites that, you know, I'm not telling you to register and sign up and, and participate in these anonymous operations, but I'm telling you, you know, look at it, see what they're doing, see why, why are they so upset? What are they targeting? You know, why are they targeting it, et cetera. Uh, you know, what tax are they using, what, et cetera. I mean, there's just, there's so much and you need to, if that's going to be your way into the community, that's fine, but just don't get lost in it. Don't get lost in that one exploit they're trying to do or that one operation. Don't, don't help them, but just pay attention to what they're doing because it's more useful than you think. Uh, and practice what you preach, you know. Anyone can stand up here and say, don't use bad passwords, don't repeat your passwords, but I would guess that probably half the people you've heard ever say that do use weak passwords, do repeat their passwords, you know, and I, I can tell you that from experience because I see a lot of organizations' passwords. I mean, I was on an engagement and I saw the CTO who used the same password from his website, which is, you know, some, some like bug tracking system all the way to a domain administrator on the domain controller. And we used that from that website, an SQL injection on that website. We were able to connect, remote connect, pivot to the domain as an administrator, and we own their network in, in 10 minutes just because he used the same password.
So I think that's really important as well. Okay. All right, so that's it. Uh, short, short, sweet talk. Uh, got 10 minutes, so if anyone has any questions, concerns. All right, thank you.